warming world will mean there is less water to go around, and that is going to put huge stress on the mechanisms by which water is allocated and shared. Our family's been here about 80 years. The river is everything. It always has been. I've never seen it look like this. It's a desert. It's no longer something hypothetical. It's no longer something that we can worry about in the future. It's happening right now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our viewers worldwide. I'm Romain Bostic, an anchor here at Bloomberg Television. I want to welcome all of you to the Bloomberg Green Solutions Summit, a summit focused today on setting and achieving bold climate commitments. Now, making those public commitments is a key tool in the collective battle against climate change. But how do you finance it? Develop the innovations needed to achieve it. How do you track that progress? In this event, we're going to examine the challenges and the opportunities associated with corporate government and financial climate commitments. Now, before we get started, we have a few announcements that we want to make. First, of course, we want to give a very warm acknowledgement to our summit founding partners, Amazon, HP, JLL, and our presenting sponsor, Iberdrola. Now, if you experience any issues with audio or video quality during this summit, try to refresh your browser, or you can use the chat box. It's going to be in the bottom right corner of your screen, and you should get some support. To submit a question to our speakers, click open the white tab, also on the right-hand side of the video window, and submit your question. You can also engage with us on social media. We really encourage that using the hashtag Bloomberg Green. All right, and now let's get started with our very first session of the day. Please join me right now in welcoming our speakers for this session. Alexandra Basarov, Global Head of Sustainable Finance for Financial Institutions, BNP Paribas. Jason Mitchell, co-head of Responsible Investing, Man Group, and Akash Shah, Senior Executive Vice President, Head of Strategy and Global Client Management, BNY Mellon. I wanna thank all three of you for being here today, and we're gonna get right down into it because when we talk about the strategies here for addressing climate change, for reducing greenhouse gases, curbing emissions, improving the environment, you have a variety of infrastructure needs that have to go along with that, and presumably a variety of finance needs as well to go along with that. So when you talk about trying to create a financing approach, financial solutions here, and I want to start with you, Jason, there is always going to be that question here in the finance industry of prioritizing ROI, prioritizing other sort of return metrics. And the question becomes, how do you prioritize those things and at the same time move climate, ESG, and some of those issues into that same priority universe? Great. Uh, Romain, thanks so much for having me on. And it's a great question because this is the one big issue that we're all trying to get more comfortable with. We're, we're effectively trying to grapple with. Um, call it sort of balancing the fiduciary duty or the sole purpose test <laughs> with these non-financial ESG or climate related issues. Um, and, and in fact, actually, we saw this sort of bear out in the recent Department of Labor uh, ruling around ESG as sort of a non-pecuniary pecuniary factor within ESG analysis. Um, I, you know, I think the starting point is First, focus on the data. Um, that sounds simple. Yes, I know, but the reality is we don't have a lot of it, um, which which in a, in inherently sort of makes us a bit comfortable, particularly from a quantitative finance perspective. We're used to sort of looking at decades and decades of different economic cycles. Um, the the data now that we're looking at is, is different. You know, by by our measure, we have around 12 years worth of as was a unrevised data that we can look at and sort of run simulations and, and stress testing around climate risk. Um, that's not a lot, but we do kind of looking forward, have to recognize that uh, this data isn't, you know, in any way static. It's 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 uh, it's being shaped by changing regulation. Clearly, uh, carbon markets, uh, um, extreme weather events, etc. So, um, I, I would say, you know, focus on the data and 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 clearly working and applying that within risk models, particularly, you know, sort of larger sort of uh, general uh, asset allocation models, where even now you you find that risk fa uh, risk climate risk is a factor really doesn't formally appear. Yeah, it doesn't formally appear. And of course, one of the reasons why you're here, Jason, as well as Alexandra and Akash, is the idea that we've sort of gone through some sort of evolution, I guess, is how we approach uh, addressing climate change uh, through the world of finance. And Alexandra, I want to come to you here because there is sort of a concern here of sort of how you sort of create uh, commitments here uh, within the finance space, whether you're talking about 
uh, what asset managers are doing, whether you're talking about what investors are doing, and of course, what the banking sector itself is doing. Uh, can you address that issue? Yeah, absolutely. And um, good morning and afternoon to everyone. And thank you for having me on here, um, Roman. Um, I think you're absolutely right. And actually, we now are in a point in time where we need to continue to close the gap between the commitment and action. Um, specifically at BNP Paribas, we have two key pillars here. One is to encourage the sustainable growth in the economy, which is, you know, generating a positive impact, you know, through our products and solutions, but equally developing our contribution to society. And here it is the adoption of supporting the energy transition. And I think what we recognize is that we've got to accelerate the you know, allocation of financial resources towards this positive business developments while also enabling the mitigation on these negative impact sectors. I think society's really understood that finance has a strong levers at work to help the world actually tackle some of these immense challenges. And we can't underestimate what these challenges are, both related to climate and increasingly biodiversity. Um, we've got a massive role to play in terms of from a leadership standpoint. I'm really thrilled that actually someone like BNP Paribas has actually been strongly engaged in the fight to climate change for a number of years now. Um, and what we try and do now specifically is to work to align its activities with the objectives set by the Paris um, Climate Agreement. Now, back in 2018, we actually signed what we call the Katowicea uh, commitment, and we joined the collective commitment to climate action uh, in September 2019, along with being a founding member of the Principles of Responsible Banking. Um, so therefore, we have committed in developing tools which bring its credit portfolio in line uh, with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. But you rightly may say, well, what does that actually mean? And actually, it does involve many elements um, because you've got to be able to identify as well as analyze and manage these climate related risks and opportunities for not only us as the group, but also for our clients. Um, and I would say there are three, five key areas. One is obviously financing, be it the likes of the renewable um, sector, um, but also having um, and developing uh, innovative financing and investment solutions, which I touched upon before, and also investing in some of these innovative um, startups. Um, we also mustn't forget our own operations where we've committed to being carbon neutral, um, as well as what we mustn't forget, which is really important here, is having our own uh, stringent and tangible sectorial policies, such as reducing exposure to the thermal coal right. and unconventional right. oil and gas industry. Um, and I'd like to say that we've actually seen this come through tangibly within our energy mix by in, in having such sectoral policies. And what we saw in 2019 in particular was that 87% of the project findings we granted um, in the electricity generation was devolved to um, renewables, whereas 0% was to the coal-related projects. All right, so you've got a, a strong commitment here coming from your organization itself. I want to bring Akash into this conversation here, and maybe he can make the link between not only what his organization is, itself is doing, but a sort of what type of feedback or what type of responses you're getting from clients uh, on this particular issue. No, it's a, it's a great point, and thank you for having me, and it's, it's a pleasure to meet everyone here today on this panel. You know, we, we come at this from what we consider a fairly unique and comprehensive perspective, um, and that's because we're, we're a different kind of financial services company. On one hand, we're a platform that has nearly $40 trillion of invested securities that we help uh, manage the data, the custody and other administration on behalf of our clients. And it gives us a view into really what's happening, where are people actually putting their money, where are the flows of uh, assets actually going in, in the, over the last few years. And then the second is, you know, we're one of the world's largest investment managers with nearly $2 trillion of assets under management. And obviously being a, a responsible investor on behalf of our clients is an important part of this. And I think to address the question directly, I think the most important link we're hearing from our clients is help us really help us educate ourselves and help us define what sustainability, climate change, and importantly, ESG investing really is. 
we just actually did a survey of our wealth management clients and more than half of them have said, you know, I'm interested in doing ESG investing, but I really want to know more about what that actually means for me. And I think that is going to be the central question and role for financial services companies like all of us here is helping educate our clients on what factors and attributes really matter to them. How do they fit into a broader context and framework? And how can they make actions in the types of investment decisions uh, that they want to make? Well, then that, that circles back, Akash, to something I guess that Jason had brought up uh, just a couple of moments ago about looking at data. And our audiences are, are able to submit questions, and we've gotten a couple of questions already, including one, uh, Jason, asking about uh, what type of data is pertinent to risk modeling and sort of you know being able to sort of make uh, the decisions with regards uh, to these investments. Yeah, it's, it's a great question because there's so many different types of data out there. Um, on one side, you have absolute oriented climate data. Um, it, you also have ESG data, which tends to be an ordinal kind of rankings relative type data set, which, which I think is, is less useful for, for understanding climate risk and risk modeling. Um, what we've seen is some, uh, uh, some real mature maturization in, in these, in these data sets. There's still, I mean, to be clear, some, some problems in it, but I think you can look, um, one at, uh, at forecasting data. Well, let me say this. You can look at simply commitments. You know, what, what commitments mm -hmm. are companies making and what is the nature of those commitments? So, um, and um, um, do they square with, with certain issues? Um, the number of companies in the oil and gas industry, for instance, um, I think have made some problematic, you know, sort of ambitious commitments around net zero on a 2050 basis. You can also look at climate uh, uh, data. Uh, unfortunately for that, much of the climate data on a company specific ba basis, the horizon doesn't go out far, far enough. We're talking about five plus years, effectively a normal kind of planning cycle for a company. Um, so there are some defaults where you can look at uh, sectoral uh, 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 climate data as well. Um, you can also look at Paris alignment type data. Uh, the transition pathway initiative um, is one such data set where you can look at a portfolio and sort of understand how aligned or unaligned this is relative to a 1.5 degree uh, 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 rise in, in global temperatures and then start to sort of also overlay that with uh uh, simple like carbon assumptions, you know, on the, on the belief that, you know, at some point we will start to see the emergence of a better linked global carbon market. And at that point, you can start to do sensitivity analyses, stress tests, look for sort of distressed assets um, from a carbon perspective. So a lot more questions are coming in here uh, from the audience. They specifically want to know a little bit more about some of the tools uh, that any of you have developed uh, to sort of, uh, you know, further their goals towards this. Uh, I don't know if uh, Akash or Alexandra, one of you uh, wants to jump in on that one. Uh, I'm happy to start. Happy uh, to. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead, okay. Alexandra. Why, why don't you? No, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say, you know, on the lending side, I um, mentioned to you that when we signed up to the Katowice Agreement, one of that was to, you know, ultimately develop a common methodology, um, which also, it, which is also an open source um, platform, uh, which is now available to all banks uh, who wish to work to align their balance sheets towards the Paris Agreement. And this was developed by the Two Degree Investing Initiative for measuring and aligning our own portfolio um, in line with the Paris Agreement. And actually we took various sectors um, and actually the ones which we took, no surprise, were those um, ones which represented the greater proportion of greenhouse gases. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, it's still work in progress. Um, you know, PACTA is promising and um, we can already use it to set practical targets, measure alignment, report on commitments um, and define next steps. And actually, we've seen over 20 uh, universal global banks now around the world which are currently working on this particular approach. Uh, we ourselves um, use it uh, for our loan book uh, on various high carbon sectors, be it the fossil fuels, um, be it electricity generation, transport, steel production, um, and cement uh, production. Akash? Yeah, we've focused a lot on uh, providing transparency and actually helping address the problem Jason also raised, which is there's a lot of data out there, but often of spurious quality. So one of the things we've developed is an, is an ESG app, which aggregates um, tens of thousands of indicators that would be attributed to individual corporations, uh, uh, data about carbon and, um, and climate change, 
And what it does is it not only aggregates it and allows you to select at a fairly definitional level of what attributes matter to you to screen uh, securities, but most importantly, it has a crowdsourcing element to it so that by definition, the highest quality and most used indicators rise to the top. And it's something that we just launched earlier this year. Uh, we have several hundred um, investors on it already, and it's a remarkably powerful tool to start really getting at the question of what are the data elements that really matter and who who's really providing them in, in the quality that we need. So, Akash, how I mean, how much knowledge do your clients typically have already about sustainability, climate change, ESG, et cetera? It varies considerably. And, you know, we're, we're a U.S. based bank, though, more than half of our clients and revenues come outside the U.S. But I think uh, and I'm curious, you know, we'll have a different perspective here based on our U.S. investors versus our non-U.S. investors. But starting with our non-U.S. investors, I think the uh, public pension and um, uh, investors are truly leading. And we hear a clarion voice from them of what they want, the standards they want to set, and the expectations that they, they have for us. When we get to our sovereign wealth clients, they're starting to explore this with more seriousness. Obviously, in the Nordics, you see that the most. But as you get elsewhere in the world, they're interested, but coming in from behind. But the client area that I think there's the biggest opportunity right now, especially to set standards and also feed into regulation, are central banks, who I think, by and large, are at a very early stage, uh, especially outside of Europe, in setting standards for the rest of us. So that's what we hear from our clients or see from our clients outside the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. in particular, when we look at our institutional clients, what they're trying to do is find a way that they can explain to their investors ultimately that investing in ESG does not curtail performance investment returns. And I think particularly in the U.S., that's a sensitive topic of being able to manage that through data and transparency, yeah. but also on outcomes because we just don't have enough track record yet. I want to go to Jason here for a second. I mean, particularly on your point about central banks and uh, potentially picking up the mantle here. And I'm curious as to, Jason, whether there are some examples here where we started to sort of see, I guess, a, a move and I guess the, a shift in the regime of sort of how this is sort of a, a push forward. I mean, are we moving away from the general incentive model that maybe has been out there for a while? Yeah, I, so I completely agree. In fact, what we're seeing, particularly out of Europe, is a sea change in terms of how sustainability kind of more widely and specifically climate risk is being addressed. Um, you're seeing that right now from a regulatory perspective. It's called the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation that is going to uh, uh, really sort of change the way uh, we think about products and and, and um and, and, and address issues around greenwashing. Uh, but I think even kind of pulling back a little bit from that, what you find from an EU perspective is something that maybe didn't look very clear a few years ago, but now is looking a lot better aligned and orchestrated, a bit more mosaic-like. You're finding uh, within the European Investment Bank, they've changed their funding policy for unabated fossil fuel. That late last year, that had a knock-on effect with the EBRD. Um, at, you've also seen the ECB change it, its uh, asset purchase program from brown bonds to green bonds. And now you've actually started to see the introduction of, uh, you know, I, I would call it conditionality, um, but the EU would call it alignment. But the idea is that, um, you know, as you federalize loans going forward around these issues, um, the expectation is that countries, and this will trickle down to corporates, uh, need to sort of align themselves to achieve that 2050 EU uh, net zero target. And so, Alexandra, uh, more questions come in here uh, from uh, our audience, and they really want to know uh, about some of the types of training uh, out there uh, or that could be out there that would be helpful to them to sort of catch, get, up, get more up to speed on this. No, and it's a very good question. And I think this is what um, the broader industry needs to focus on, because, you know, I would use a quote which Einstein often says is, we cannot solve the problems with the same thinking we used when we created them in the sense of we've got this big problem, be it around climate or be it social issues. Um, and so it really is going to take a big mindset shift 
while also understanding the fundamentals uh, of the environmental concerns and the social concerns. And actually, it's been able to translate what we're dealing with into financial language. And actually, when I took this role on, I came up with these seven R's because you can relate back to them in all incidences, which is be it its risk, its return, its regulation, it's your ability to recruit and retain your employees and your talent. And ultimately, um, as uh, Jason mentioned, it's becoming you know, a requirement as, as more governments actually set net zero ambitions, which we'll see a lot more of during the course of uh, this weekend with the Climate Ambition Summit happening. Um, and then let's not forget your retention, your reputation. And I think the training, therefore, really needs to resonate with the audience. And what we found is that you really need to bring in a lot of external experts. And actually, we've worked very heavily with the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership. We've put over 150 employees through that. But at the same time, we want to ensure that all of our employees can understand this transformation which is going through the economies. So we ensure the whole 200,000 employees across 70 odd countries have that baseline understanding. But I think the reality is it takes lots of different sources to get this training done, both on the analytical side, but actually real live examples we find that the biggest uptake and understanding of what we're dealing with and grappling with is when people hear it directly, um, both from the client's perspective, because they realize it's very real and material, and we are going through this transition that's required. Um, and we mustn't forget, we want it through the whole value chain, be it from the onboarding, be it the KYCs, be it to risk, be it the business to actually identify uh, the business opportunities. So it's actually both front and obviously back office across functions and um, front office staff. But I do you know, stress that you know, sustainable finance is one where you've got to work with all stakeholders uh, across society to really get a good understanding of what this agenda means for all of us. Akash, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I'll also say that the moment is now. Um, and I say that because we're reaching a generational transfer. Uh, I, I get a group of um, millennial managers together on a regular basis, as I am one. And uh, it's a number of us are in senior management roles, you know, really uh, shepherding, I think, the intergenerational moment that we're in. And one of the things we talk about is how sustainability and really understanding how that plays through as a manager will be the same importance of a skill as like learning how to use Excel or PowerPoint 25 years ago. I, it's, it's going to be something that we're going to have to be able to do in every decision that we make, whether it's about where we choose to invest, how we lead our people, how we, um, how, how we build the next generation of great companies. And I think that the kind of training that we will all need um, is going to be so comprehensive, and we're in the very early stages of being able to provide it for ourselves. So I, I'm I'm really looking for others to jump in here, and uh, from from the uh, from the academic world, from the business world, and the broader community, because I think there's a lot more to learn. And so once we start going down this path, at some point you come back down to investors and clients who are going to not only look for results, but they want to sort of make sure that there is sort of a, uh, I guess, a sound methodology in evaluating progress on that front. And I guess, Jason, I'll start with you on this question is sort of what is the methodology that we have right now where we can make sure that the assessments we're making are accurate? I think uh, uh, there are I would say that that's it's it's very individual. I, it, you know, th this is an incredible time where firms are are investing heavily in terms of trying to develop frameworks internally and borrowing from standards frameworks uh, or, uh, or or other areas. And, and effectively, what Akash had said was something about uh, an analytics tool. We've also built one within our firm. I, I think you're seeing many managers and asset owners build these, taking these sort of often very disparate data sets and 
adding some proprietary research uh, and, and investment and trying to sort of divine something out, out of whether it's ESG risk or more specifically carbon risk, um, and then apply that within portfolios. Obviously, from a risk perspective, risk management perspective, but also trying to um, see what sort of uh, uh, you can find from a, uh, an alpha perspective as well. And some of the tools and the products that are out there, I mean, uh, our, our audience is asking this now. I mean, where can some of those things be found? I mean, really? I would say that, sure, sure. I would point to, I mean, there are some very well-known data providers, uh, MSCI, Sustainalytics, Bloomberg is obviously in the game, Rep Risk. Um, but what you're finding now is, particularly if you're quant-oriented, a lot of focus around non-traditional, uh, very alternative data sets out there. Uh, and those can be, uh, whether it's social media uh, or, or um, uh, you know, applying tools like natural language processing or, or machine learning into areas and, 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 and again, trying to sort of marry different kinds of analyses or, or think of different types of horizons. So you can build something that is very sentiment oriented, which tends to be sort of a, a near term factor with something that is maybe more economically intuitive over a long term basis. All right. And then sticking on this topic of, I guess, the methodology to sort of measure uh, and finance these commitments. Uh, another question coming in here, Alexandra, and I'll, I'll pose this to you, is how closely uh, your organization uh, is aligned uh, to SASB and upgrading your reporting towards those standards? No, I think that's a very valid question. Actually, we've seen recent uh, reports coming out that companies that adopt ESG focus alignment towards SASB, in particular the defined um, material issues, actually realize um, a 4.8% uh, bump in annual outperformance while those firms that don't actually realize a 2.2% um, penalty. So we are seeing both clients, um, especially you know, within the uh, private equity space, really start to ensure that the disclosures um, and in reporting is increasingly more aligned uh, with organizations uh, such as SASB in terms of the reporting. Um, you know, we mustn't forget also the work you know, when it comes specifically around climate um, with the TCFD reporting. Um, and here, this is something we've been a very strong advocate of because all of these methodologies um, ultimately needs the disclosure in the first instance. Um, so that is obviously something uh, that, you know, we continue to work with to ensure that that is enhanced as well as more broader scope in terms of coverage of the disclosures. Akash, to you as well. Well, we're we're focused on. Uh, so I, I'm going to speak first as as a bank, right, and about the reporting we do ourselves, and then talk about how we enable the industry. I think what we are we're committed to at BNY Mellon is um, taking an aggressive st stance towards uh, transparency. So we will be publishing our our sustainability report in the next few weeks. Uh, we're going to be very clear about the data that we feel very confident about sharing and how we're progressing and also where we're going to be investing to build additional transparency. And one of the things our management team is committed to is setting near-term goals as well as longer-term ones because we just can't, you know, we can't allow investors to manage us quarter to quarter on our financial performance but then give us 30 years on our sustain sustainability track record, right? So we're trying to bring them more into cohesion and uh, that's yeah. gonna be the big plan for 21. All right, o only a couple of uh, minutes left and I wanna pose this question uh, to all of you here as sort of what you're expecting to see uh, out of the next big UN conference. Uh, obviously, our people are looking uh, towards uh, COP26. Um, what are you expecting to see? Do you feel businesses are ready for uh, the changes and what can they do to prepare for those changes? Uh, I'll start with you, Akash. Well, I, I think we're 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 mindful of what we hope is going to be a tonal shift towards action in the new year. Um, I think we're mindful of a administration change as well here in the U.S. and the role that the uh, that the the United States and our institutions are going to play. In some ways, over the last few years, um, our banks and businesses have been leading uh, the government, and we look for more cohesion to that. So that's something we're excited for. Jason. Yeah, so I would completely agree um, from bringing the U.S. into the fold of the sort of the, the global conversation again. Um, that's going to be incredibly refreshing. I think there's a lot of work to be done around carbon pricing from a global perspective. I think that there is 
Yeah, in the new uh, administration, I actually do think that there is bipartisan support there. I also think that we're going to see more companies sort of push on commitments. Um, and I would even say harder commitments, longer term commitments. Um, so, so more constructive for, you know, in terms of uh, investors trying to sort of understand this. All right. And, and I'll and just quickly conclude um, with the, I, I agree with that. And I think we'll also see a greater focus on the private and public sectors uh, coming together. And that's been a real focus area of ours. And that's really what's gonna start transforming a lot of these sustainable finance solutions is a greater collaboration uh, between the public and private sector. All right, wonderful conversation here. I wanna thank uh, all three of you, of course, Alexandra Basaroff, uh, Global Head of Sustainable Finance for Financial Institutions over at BNP Paribas. Of course, Jason Mitchell, Co-Head of Responsible Investment. Man Group, and of course, Akash Shah, Senior Executive Vice President, Head of Strategy and Global Client Management, BNY Mellon. And of course, I want to thank our audience here uh, for helping us kick off the start here of the Bloomberg Green Solutions Summit. And I encourage our audience uh, to stick with us here. Of course, we have another great session coming right up here. And I'm going to hand it off right now to Antha Williams, Head of Environmental Programs for our very own Bloomberg Philanthropies. We're in a race against time on climate change, and we have to start moving faster right now. I think everybody now understands that urgent action is needed. We have to limit uh, the increase of temperature to 1.5 degrees, and to do that, we have to act now, and we have to act at all levels of government. This world is at a critical point, a point where people have waited 30 years trying to address climate change. There is a new momentum that has come we have what I would call the beginning of civil disobedience on climate change. That historically has always been a very important component of any major political change, and hence it is very welcome. To overcome the current climate crisis, we need to make changes starting now. Mayors and local leaders understand that because they see the effects of climate change firsthand. Cities is where it happens, where the crisis strikes first, but also where the solutions are found first. It is the momentum to act now, at the global level, at the national level, and at the local level. Young people are standing up, so we really notice there's a lot of changes, and you have to really bring pressure to those who are not accepting that if you're not going this direction, we can't save the world. Hi there, my name is Antha Williams and I lead the Bloomberg Philanthropies Global Climate and Environment Program. I'm really excited to be joined virtually today by an esteemed panel of climate leaders to discuss the future of climate action here in the United States as we anticipate President-elect Biden's inauguration just 41 days from now. First, I wanna start by introducing our panel. I'm proud to share the screen today with Gina McCarthy, the 13th Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency under President Obama, and now President and CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Bill Ritter, the 41st Governor of the State of Colorado and the Founder and Director of the Center for the New Energy Economy at Colorado State University. Congresswoman Haley Stevens, representing Michigan's 11th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives and Mayor Marty Walsh, the mayor of the city of, the Bos of Boston and recently appointed the chair of U.S. Climate Mayors. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, we'll make this as interactive as possible. So I have questions for each of the panelists, but I'll invite you to kick questions and comments to each other as well. And we will um, have some time for audience questions. So I'll kick the first question over to you, Gina. Um, December 2nd, of course, marked the 50-year anniversary of the Environmental Protection Agency. And as you know better than anyone else, the mission of that agency is to protect public health and the environment. But it has been pretty off track for the last several years. So what can President-elect Biden do to get the EPA back on track? Well, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for, for letting me be here and with all the other esteemed panelists. It's great to be here. Um, I, First of all, I think you were being pretty generous. Um, let, let's make it clear. EPA has been totally out of the picture and never mind just off track for the past four years. And so the most important thing that, that we can do is work that I think has already been started. President Biden has really developed the most aggressive climate plan that we have ever seen uh, for a president coming into office. I think he ought to do it. 
Every single thing in there is good for us, good for the planet, will help public health and help restore the kind of mission of, of EPA. But in terms of EPA itself, you know, it's it's time to get our Anthony Fauci of the environment as our, our administrator. You know, we'd, we need to be done with dismantling the science and ignoring it. It is all about going back to fact-based decisions, making science-based decisions. And I think you need to send that signal right out of the gate with somebody that you trust who can, who can rebuild that, that agency, because it's, it's in tough shape right now. You know, we have had many people leave. We take science off of the web page so that the public can access it. They're doing everything they can over their last few weeks to be to turn back the clock decades in terms of what EPA can do and is supposed to do with the, the laws that it is required to implement. And so we, we need to really send a, a strong signal and then rebuild the agency and obviously Standard setting has to be one of the key things that you do. That's what EPA is all about. So you can't just think big thoughts. You have to put them into action. That means new car, car rules right away. we got to get at transportation. It's the number two biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Let's go for it. you got to reinstitute uh, uh, standards in the power sector because the, basically uh, Biden sent a, an extraordinarily strong signal in his plan and said that by 2035, we're going to have clean energy. Well, that means now, and that means aggressive enough that you achieve that target in 2035. So there were so many things that he has authority and responsibility to do. And, and lastly, there's many things to do, but his all of government approach, I think, is going to be one of the most useful and engaging opportunities, because even if the Senate doesn't go his way, and even if there is no interest in the kind of stimulus we need, uh, because the Senate isn't in the control of somebody who wants to do that, then we have to use the authority of the federal government writ large, and it exists. We spent $4.79 trillion in the 2020 budget. That's a lot of money if you think about directing it towards a future of clean energy that's better for us, not just the planet. There's some great um, meaty points there that I want to come back to, including the significance of the, the Biden-Harris commitment to 100 percent clean energy by 2035 and the important signal that that has sent uh, to the rest of the world. Um, but next, I want to kick it over to you, Governor Ritter, um, just to talk about, you know, from your perspective, um, having led a state, working with a lot of Western governors in particular, you know, dur during this period of time where the federal government has been moving completely in the opposite direction um, from what the science says we need on climate change, states have really taken the lead in making their own climate commitments. I know there's now you know, up from just a couple states two years ago that had 100% clean energy commitments to now a handful of states and territories. So can you just speak to what states have been doing and how you think the Biden-Harris administration can work most effectively to build on that progress and really accelerate it? Yeah, sure, Antha. You're right. States have really taken the lead, particularly over the last four years. <clears throat> it, was, <clears throat> it was not that way. Um, or there were states that were not very active. And, you know, the 2018 elections, we saw a number of governors run on 100% clean, on 100% renewable, on big emissions reduction target. Uh, most of them won their elections. And then we saw a lot of state legislators do the same. And so in 2019, we saw several states uh, actually set targets or goals that were emissions targets or renewable portfolio standard targets or whatever. They were very, very ambitious. And and line up, I think, with uh, Biden's climate plan, plan. So states have done a variety of really important things. There are 25 states that are part of the United States Climate Alliance, where the governors have signed on. That's half of the states, and they cover a significant portion of the population. But um, to pick up where Gina left off, there's also 23 states, I think, with low-emitting vehicle standards, LEV standards. There are 10 that have ZEV, zero-emitting vehicle standards. And you know, those were all in peril because of the litigation from the Trump administration trying to litigate the California waiver that uh, was part of the Clean Air Act when it was first passed in the early 70s. And that 
now, I think, is all going to be reversed. And we've seen big automakers as well pull out of that alliance that were pressing that litigation. And so we're going to see states be able to do what they need to do to even get out ahead of the EPA with zero emitting vehicle, lower emitting vehicle standards. And those are the kinds of things that states have been or are willing to do because of state action and because of market economics. We've got like 57 major uh, utilities in America that have set their own emissions target reduction. Nobody would have believed that 10 years ago. So that's a big thing to happen in the last 10 years. And interesting, in the last four years, most of those targets were set while Trump was being hostile toward uh, the clean energy and really toward climate action. And, and now you have major utilities and states all acting in a way that says, we have to do this, we have to do it as quickly as we can. And so I, I think what you'll see are states hoping for this willing partner at the federal government so that we can work together sort of as federalism was intended to do in trying to tackle this very big problem in a way that's 180 degrees different than the Trump administration of the last four years. That's a, that's a really important point, and the 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 market signal that these strong state actions send, um, so that the private sector is sees the writing on the wall and is and is moving in that direction because it because it makes sense, um, right. and it 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 uh, it's it's profitable as well as the the right thing to do. Um, over to you, uh, Congresswoman Stevens. Um, other countries are starting to set very ambitious goals. We saw China, of course, set a net zero goal by 2060, followed in short order by South Korea and Japan setting their own um, net zero emissions goals. Um, and, you know, they're making massive federal investments in emerging technologies in order to meet those goals. So what, from where you sit on the federal side, what can the U.S. do to catch up? Yeah, well, you know, I sit on two sides of this. One is the, the Michigan side as well as the federal side. And, of course, Governor Ritter gave a, a nice jumping off place with a, a federal government that's going to act cohesively to Gina's point with the standards and the holistic all of government, all of country approach. We obviously know we need to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. The House of Representatives voted on that last year. You think of the irony of just two years ago being in a government shutdown with the EPA largely shuttered. And the time that was lost with the uh, emission standards, uh, particularly the testing, and we're over at the North American Auto Show with vehicles looking to get off the platform, but yet they can't because they can't go through the testing center. And that's just lost time. And this is something that I think we have to have a reckoning around, around functional good government that is actually at the table. So when you look at the international indexes that you just laid out, Antha, Obviously, the United States needs to be at the table. Uh, you know, you can talk about uh, America first, but it's got to be America at the table, American leadership uh, setting the stage. Where I come from, we see the automakers with big goals, um, similar to what Governor Ritter just mentioned with our energy companies. You know, you talk to any major automaker and they're going to tell you, we recognize where the world is moving. 300 million, uh, you know, just in being invested, indexing to where... China's going, indexing to where the international consumer base is going. And so we've obviously got to keep pace. We've got to look at where the American consumer base is going to go. And Joe Biden, President-elect Joe Biden, has been setting those goals. And where Congress, particularly uh, our Democratic majority, is looking towards is not just the, the legislative agenda, which is certainly really exciting and somewhere where we need to go, passing real legislation, but also having agencies that employ scientists and our agencies that we can actually work with to achieve these goals uh, and continue to be leaders at the international table. That's great what South Korea is doing. It's so inspiring. We want the United States either working in partnership or setting our own goals that the rest of the world is going to continue to look at. And what we're seeing is that industry is moving there as well. That's terrific. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Mayor Welsh, I'm going to turn it over to you. You have done a ton of work on these issues, of course, as as mayor of Boston, including thinking about the 
the not just the climate opportunity, but also the opportunity to provide good jobs um, as part of the, the mix in, in meeting our goals on climate change. As, as I mentioned at the, the outset, you're the incoming chair of U.S. climate mayors. And so both in Boston, but, but for the broader set of cities that you're leading on these issues, what are your priorities for city leaders as we think about the, the Biden administration's commitments to move to um, net zero by 2035? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on here. I'm on an esteemed panel, and, and it's great to be on with all of you. And I want to uh, just recognize um, Gina just received an award from a, uh, an organization in Boston, A Better City. Uh, and she's been a, a, a good friend to Boston, a good friend to me, and a good friend to the environment and the country. So thank you, Gina, for all your great work. Now, I, I think it's imperative at this point in time that our recovery from COVID-19 be equitable. And I think uh, it, it, it's going to include public health, public safety, racial justice, and, and a healthy environment. And, and that's what we're going to have to do. Uh, I think it's important that we have to act now um, when it comes to climate in order to prevent irreversible damage to our communities. So I'm certainly... We don't really want to talk about the last almost four years here that we've turned the clock back. Uh, we have work to do. I, I think the, the one thing that I would say that Climate Mayors was created in 2014 uh, by Eric Garcetti, myself, and a handful of mayors. And today we have over 460 mayors. So when Gina was at the EPA, there was mayors involved in, 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 in climate resiliency. Uh, but today we have an infrastructure throughout the United States of America of over 460 mayors ready to hit the ground running. I mean, this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, believes in science. We're excited about that. We're excited about partnering, working together. Uh, we're excited about l l not just hitting our goals, but actually um, do doing doing the work that needs to happen right now. You know, in Boston, uh, we talked about the other day, we have many, many climate programs that were reducing carbon emission. We're, we're going to choice energy, electric electricity. Uh, we have a plan for Boston Harbor. So now it's time to, to, to as, as an organization, whether it's climate mayors or, or mayors individually around the country, uh, to, to really have an administration that we want to move forward on our plans. We want to reduce carbon emissions. We want to make sure that we think about electrifying our public transit. We need to make sure that we're, we're protecting uh, our coastline. We need to make sure that we're, we're dealing with heat deserts all across America. That, that's what has to happen. I mean, the climate's real. Climate change is real. Uh, and the impacts is the biggest threat to human beings in this world. Uh, and that's no different for here in the United States of America. So I am excited about what the future holds. Uh, but that excitement can only last for a short period of time. There is lots of work that we need to do. There was lots of work we needed to do before uh, Trump, President Trump got elected president. And, and that, that work in some cases has been stalled. So we have to catch up. Thanks for those comments. Um, and you mentioned the the fact that as a, a local leader, you're facing these um, these multiple challenges at the same time: recovery, economic recession, um, the fight for racial equality, and the impacts of climate change, all at the exact same time. Um, so I, I want to turn it over to each of you um, just to speak to that. I'll start with you, Gina, but I'll I'll let others um, kind of jump in. You know, one of the things that that NRDC has been working on at the local level is 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 how you craft um, policy solutions to climate change that also address environmental justice and equity. Um, what do you think are some of the top areas of, of opportunity um, in addressing these, these multiple challenges at the exact same time? Well, Anthony, first of all, uh, let me thank my mayor for continuing the incredible progress in Boston. I'm just so proud of you. And and I think we absolutely uh, balance off the the Midwest accent w without without question. But maybe not. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think Antha, the thing that surprised me most as somebody who's been in the environmental world for a long time is the fact that people actually didn't know U.S. EPA is a public health agency. That's essentially what we do. And those headlines that talked about who is in the you know basically being impacted most by COVID-19 just made it very clear that, you know, when, when, when you have a public health crisis, which climate change is, it's always the black and brown community, the low-income community, our indigenous communities that suffer the most. And one of the best things about the Biden plan was his absolute commitment to say 40% of the investments that we are going to make on climate are going to go to environmental justice communities to improve their stature to grow jobs, to make sure that we listen to the kind of solutions they want. 
And I think the really important thing to remember is that we do have solutions now. We don't need to go in a laboratory and start stirring something up. We have things already on the shelves that we can move forward. One of the reasons why we're so excited to be part of ACCC, the American Climate Cities Challenge, is that we know mayors are, are like crazy doing what democracy says, right? You are, the, you are the place where innovation happens. And so NRDC's job is to nurture that innovation, to prove that it grows jobs, to prove that it impacts people's health in a positive way, and that it can build constituencies that will go further and further and demand more and more, which is why you ladder it up to the state level, which is Bill's expertise. He knows that you got to prove things locally to make it happen at the state level. And then when you prove the state, things can move at the federal government level. And so I don't want everyone to think that all of a sudden this is just going to miraculously, the federal government comes in and sweeps in and does things. It never happens that way. But the awesome thing is that, it, that we need to grow jobs. We need to invest now in order to provide economic stability. We need to be part of the world community. We need to build and do manufacturing in our country again, which all says that our investments over the next few years are going to chart the course of the future, not just for the U.S. economy, but for the world, because that's how big we are and that's what the stage we're going to be operating on once again. And if we do this right, clean energy is the horse that's going to take us into the future. That's the engine of growing jobs. That's the engine that's going to clean up our cities. You know, it is not a painful opportunity. It is an opportunity for progress. And so I'm just deathly afraid that we're going to give any room in this conversation uh, uh, that we're going to have over the next four years for somebody to say, if we invest in climate, we're going to kill jobs, or we're going to slow down the economy, or it's just going to help the wealthy, or it's, which is all just nonsense. Fundamentally, this is, has to be about the challenge of racism holding communities back, those communities getting advantaged, our ability to grow jobs everywhere, not just where it's easy to do, our investment in manufacturing again, our investment in infrastructure, which is falling apart in so many communities, and our recognition that all of that is part and parcel of how we hand our children a bright future. So we have to own this narrative. We cannot let the naysayers take it over. Those are great comments. And oh, sure, go ahead. And then I'll turn over Sorry, to you, because I, I know you're to... facing these issues in Michigan, too. Yeah, go ahead, Mayor. You know, G Gina brings up a good point. The green infrastructure, uh, investments in green infrastructure, infrastructure obviously addresses climate. There's a huge opportunity here to create hundreds of thousands of jobs in green building, resilient infrastructure, uh, drawing on incredible talents and innovation of American people. We're going through, I can speak for Boston, going through this pandemic, uh, about a third of our hospitality workers aren't coming back to work. People that work in our restaurants, people that work in our hotels, people that work in different industries. Th there is an amazing opportunity in cities like Boston and across America. Uh, we're positioned to help lead and implement this vision. Uh, f f federal aid is critical, um, whether it's uh, implementing nature-based solutions to protect our coastlines or, or training people in the green economy. I agree with Gina. I think I hear, as mayor, you, you, there's another side here you hear that's too often trying to pull down the investments that people want to make. Climate investments in up in front, and we, you know, it's very important to understand this, that for every billion dollars that we spent in climate resiliency, we saved $19 billion in, in mitigation of disaster relief. And that's something that, that is real. And the fact that we have a partner finally in the White House that understands this and recognizes this bold action, the governor talked about uh, the importance of governors and the importance of states uh, stepping up and having plans. They have plans, cities have plans, the Congress is ready to act. We're at a unique moment in, in history and time for us to really take take bold, bold action, and, and I think looking at and not being afraid, Gene is absolutely right, let's not be afraid of the climate, 
let's embrace the climate and let's go out there and and really think about what the future of our country's economics is going to look like. This is as much about economics in some cases, our economy, as it is in, in protecting in protecting our cities and our states and our country. Representative <clears throat> Stevens, I wonder if you want to come in here from the Michigan perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I was going to say, you know, it could it could have been Marty or I going next because it's it's such a point about the role too that cities play and have continued to play in terms of what Gina was talking about, which is the infrastructure guarantee, uh, the infrastructure guarantee of certainly in Michigan we care a lot about the the roadways and we've actually been struggling with maintaining our roadways, our bridges. We had a dam break, uh, but it's also the clean air and fresh water to drink, and we see a disparity where uh, certain zip codes on health inequities and different investments uh, that that. Get Get entangled, but yet my my water lines in my suburban district, I represent the suburbs of Detroit, are tied to the city of Detroit. And so our boil water advisory, right? And we're, we're getting in the weeds here on infrastructure, but it's also tied to the bigger picture of where we need to go as, as a country and to address what you know, I think has been so nicely said here about racial inequities uh, and and broadly uh, on on infrastructure and and look, we're going to have uh, the public private partnership. Uh, I, I, I think and Gina knows this all too well. Um, the grand bargain that needs to get cut by bringing the companies along. You pay the price when you don't have the leadership at the helm in terms of federal government. So what did we? you know, see most recently, well, it, we, we saw industry being divided in two. We see the standards going every which way. We see the rest of the world moving in a certain way. I'm talking about MPG here, you know, and our big carbon goals and what we need to do on energy. There's a reawakening moment right now in the Midwest as it pertains to energy efficiency and where we need to go and where the investment is going to come and how that gets spurred. Couldn't agree with the mayor more that we are absolutely at uh, a, a very energetic and an inspiring moment. And in fact, having served in the Obama administration during another downturn in our economy, we're going to be able to springboard from those lessons learned uh, and, and some of those initial successes and be able to do big and bold. I believe that we can achieve Vice President uh, Biden, now President-elect Biden's uh, climate goals uh, as it pertains to our manufacturing and infrastructure needs in a place called Michigan. If Thanks I, if for I those hop remarks. In, yeah, please do. Just, just think about it um, again this way. So we talked about those 57 major utilities that have these ambitious targets. You got the Biden administration saying 2035 is going to be net zero power in the electricity sector. Um, there's going to be a massive cash infusion, <clears throat> and that cash, <clears throat> if spent the right way, and if it dovetails with a stimulus or with other public spending can be public-private infusion of cash and spent in places where there are marginalized communities or disadvantaged communities, communities of color, many places that have uh, carbon resources still burning. So we have to take the coal out of those resources, make sure we don't build new fossil fuel in those communities, and at the same time, use that infusion to actually create wealth in the communities. The environmental justice folks that I've talked to said a lot of times, you know, we worry about affordability. The utility sector thinks, oh, if we keep rates low, that's environmental justice. That's not. It's what Gina said. It's workforce training, but it's also wealth creation in communities that have been disadvantaged. And we have like this 10 to 15 year period where we're going to spend a lot of money and we spend it the right way. We address public health and we address environmental justice and racism in, in these communities that's been systemic in many respects and rebuild an economy for everybody. We really have this opportunity to weave, weave those strands of the braid together. And I think the Biden administration understands this probably better than anybody before. I wonder, um, you know, the, the the infusion of cash, the opportunity for the public-private partnerships, as has been mentioned, is is sort of one side of the coin. The jobs creation potential. Um, the, on the flip side is the incredible budget crunch that many states and localities are are experiencing. Um, and so, as you think about 
the the sort of policy levers um, for making a difference in that you know area of just significant budget constraints locally. Um, you know what what are some of the opportunities um, for addressing that? Well, it's, it's been mentioned right. before, but there are, there are enormous economic opportunities around rebuilding the infrastructure in this country. Uh, there's job and wealth creation opportunities there. There are opportunities to transition out of fossil fuels into uh, the clean infrastructure that's necessary. But uh, as the Congresswoman mentioned, energy efficiency is the number one opportunity that still is in front of us in terms of uh, spending a little bit of money to have big, big things that can happen. We saw it in our funding, the amount of money that was available for energy efficiency had huge returns that was available then to the economies in states. And so just think about these as investments, and you're right, states and localities often and right now have huge budget crunches, but there are ways to spend those dollars that have returns and a transition to a clean energy economy is not a, a, a net zero game. You don't lose one, you don't lose jobs in order to do the transition. In fact, you build the economy that way. And that's really the opportunity in front of us. And I think you just need to careful. appropriate the dollars effectively to you, Gov and Marty. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work on that in Congress. <laughs> but but I, I think we can't look at the money as a way of, of putting up a roadblock. And I think that we have to think creatively about this. I think that, you know, when you think about the investments that need to happen and where's the money going to come from, some of it is going to be a relationship with a public-private partnership. So, some of it's going to be philanthropic money. Some of it's going to be federal money. Some of it's going to be state and city money. And I'll give you one quick example. Anyone has a chance, Google um, Resilient Boston Harbor. Uh, we, we have a plan to build a 47-mile coastline buffer uh, connecting people back to the harbor. And two, two of the projects, or three of the projects on that, uh, one is a, a, a one of our vulnerability points is in the north end of Boston, and we just did over a park. So our Parks and Recreation Department just redid a park, a new baseball field, softball field. And what we did was we raised the field four feet, and now what that is, that's a buffer. The sea level rise rises. The park is there to protect from keeping the water coming into the, this part of Boston. We also built another park on the South Boston waterfront, Martin's Park, named after Martin Richard, the little boy who lost his life in the Marathon bombing. And that park is a fully inclusive park for kids with any type of disabilities. And there's a buffer there as well. So it, it acts as a park. We built it as a park, but we built in some resiliency into that park. And that's all part of our 47 Coastline Park. And now we have two projects a little further down the Four Point Channel that the de pri developers, private developers, are going to be making the investment in continuing that, that not, not I wouldn't call it a wall, but that continuing 47 mile of reconnecting people back to the harbor. So I think that we, we get caught up in this big dollar figure, and it is a big dollar figure, but there's ways through our budgets being creative by doing, whether it's upgrading our transit systems or what have you, and building in infrastructure, green infrastructure into those programs. And that, that, that reduces the burden of the debt. And we do need, the private sector needs to step up here. Because as we think about protecting investments, we're also protecting their investments. So as new developments go forward, we're, we're looking at doing new green standards moving forward. There's a question in here. There was a question in one of the, from the, one of the panelists about reducing carbon. We, we, we need to build these buildings cleaner now and not, not later on down the road be retrofitting them 20 years from now. Those are really good points. And you obviously have been a leader um, in Boston on building performance standards and, and just the, you know, the potential um, for good, creating good jobs with these deep energy efficiency retrofits, which, you know, make healthier buildings, healthier communities and reduce a whole lot of carbon pollution at the exact same time. Um, we have time for just a quick speed round. So I'm going to I'm going to give each of the panelists an opportunity just to say two quick sentences about um, as you think about the climate opportunity in just the year or two that's ahead of us, what are you most focused on? And I'll start with you, Gina. All right, very quickly. I am most focused on January 20th, um, having a change in occupancy at the White House. Um, I am interested in making sure that we remain hopeful, that we recognize that every dollar we spend on clean energy in our future is a dollar that also spends 
on environmental justice communities and those issues and on good food and on good housing and great cities like the city of Boston staying great. Uh, this is all moments in time for us to get more than a dollar for what we put in. We need two That's first, three first, four first. I like that, four first. Over to you, Mayor Walsh. Uh, Paris, Paris uh, Climate Agreement 2015, we joined. Uh, we, we were taken out of it. Uh, cities stayed in it. Uh, in 2021, we're back in there to protect the planet, protect America, protect Boston, protect the world. That's great. Thank you. Governor Ritter. So I'm going to be focused on states still, uh, focused on governors, but particularly Antha, trying to take the politics out of this conversation to depoliticize this so that both sides of the aisle understand why we're doing this and why it's important that we act quickly. That's terrific. And Representative Stevens. After Paris, the forging of unlikely alliances to meet our goals, bring all stakeholders to the table and continue to deliver for our big climate goals as a country. That's a terrific wrap up. Thank you so much to each of our panelists for joining us. Thank you so much for all that you're doing to solve climate change and look forward to continuing to work with all of you in the year ahead. Thanks. Thank you. The warming world will mean there is less water to go around and that is going to put huge stress on the mechanisms by which water is allocated and shared. Our family's been here about 80 years. The river is everything, it always has been. I've never seen it look like this, it's a desert. It's no longer something hypothetical. It's no longer something that we can worry about in the future. It's happening right now. Hello, everyone. I'm Lauren Keel. I'm the general manager for Bloomberg Green, and I'm excited to join you for a conversation on how companies are setting and achieving their corporate climate commitments. I have a fantastic group with me today. I've got Edgar Blanco, who is the director of Net Zero Product Technology and Science for Amazon. Ellen Jakowski, who's the chief sustainability and social impact officer for HP. Richard Batten is a global chief sustainability officer for JLL. And Jonathan Cole, who's the managing director of Ipadrola Renewables Offshore Wind Division. We know that making major climate commitments takes a ton of work, especially for the size and scale of the companies that are with me today. So we're going to talk about that, that whole process, the, the valuation that's needed, the buy-in that's needed, the challenges that can be, be overcome. So I've asked each of our four panelists to select a corporate climate commitment, something that their organization has done. They're going to share that climate commitment with you to start, and then we're going to unpack it. So looking at things like, why did they select that commitment? What is collaboration or what, what input has it taken to build that commitment out? How do you scale a solution like this? What barriers pop up along the way? And then how do we really track and measure the outcome of these commitments? So first, let's go around and, and share what we'll be talking about. Edgar, I'm going to start with you. Tell us about Amazon's climate commitment. Well, uh, th thanks uh, for, for an invitation to share uh, this important topic. Uh, again, uh, we, we in Amazon, we really uh, all know that the scientists have told us we have a limited time window to make the change we need uh, to achieve and stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050. So we actually work backwards from, from the science, and in September 19, we joined Global Optimisms and co-founded and became the first signatory of the Climate Pledge. That is kind of our, our main commitment uh, on this topic. And the pledge is three, three, three pieces of commitments. You know, one, make sure we measure and report the greenhouse gases, that we actually implement decarbonization uh, that are in line with the Paris agreements. Uh, but we are also committed to achieve net zero carbons by 2040, uh, so 10 years earlier than the Paris agreements. Uh, in addition to that climate pledge commitment, that really is uh, the one we started working backwards from, we also have announced that we're going to be achieving 100% renewable energy in our operations by 2025. And we have also committed to have 50% of all of our shipments uh, to customers to be net zero carbon by 2030. So those are kind of, in, in a nutshell, our three commitments, uh, net zero carbon by 2040, 100% uh, renewable energy by 2025, and 50% of our shipments uh, to customers to be net zero carbon by 2030, all of it working backwards from, from the Paris Agreement 10 years earlier. Great, we'll dig into all of these, but really interesting different scopes, different timelines of these commitments, different people it's engaging with. 
Uh, so we'll come back to all of those. But Ellen, let's let's go to you. Tell us about HP's commitment. Sure. Well, you know, for years, obviously, we've recognized that climate change is coming and we need to take responsibility and action in this space. Uh, we were the first in our industry to publish uh, our comprehensive carbon footprint, as well as set comprehensive carbon reduction goals. And our uh, commitment to uh, taking action in this space only continues to strengthen. Um, obviously, one of our most significant businesses, though, is making and selling printers, which, of course, uses paper. And that inextricably ties us to the importance of forests. So one of our pledges is to make every page printed forest positive, carbon neutral, and part of a circular economy. Um, a couple of years ago, we set a goal to achieve zero deforestation associated with HP brand paper and our paper-based product packaging by 2020. And we reached the goal of 100% zero deforestation with our HP branded paper uh, two years ahead of schedule. And we are above 90% in achieving our zero deforestation goal for the paper-based product packaging. And this is really all about uh, what we call our HP Forest Positive Printing Framework. And the concept there is to go beyond our own footprint and to help really shift the whole industry here um, and go beyond what our existing sustainable fiber sourcing programs are for our company. It includes partnerships with NGOs like WWF and Arbor Day, and it's really targeted on protecting forests, improving responsible forest management, um, and also helping develop science-based targets. So a lot of work to do in this space, uh, but we've already made some significant contributions, uh, but clearly more to do. Great, Richard, let's go to you because I know you're also thinking about science-based targets in your, in your goal. So tell us about what, what JLL is working on. That's right. So JLL is a real estate service company, and we have based our commitments around SBTI. So we are really focused on um, our 1.5 degree commitment by 2034, which is a scope one and two reduction of 70% by then. Um, no offsets uh, included in that, and a 54% reduction in our scope three. Uh, by, by 2034. On top of that, and it's quite an easy one for us to do, is then to do a net zero carbon buildings commitment by 2030 with the World Green Building Council. That's quite straightforward for us. Scripts one and two are sort of manageable. Our big issue is that we manage, uh, on behalf of our clients, real estate that is 1,500 times the square footage of, that we ourselves occupy. So our big issue looking forward is around the... Uh, the scope three emissions, uh, our internal emissions, scope three emissions, air travel, etc. We can manage that. The big issue is 95% of our footprint is our, our, our client scope two emissions that are our scope three. And that's the piece that we're working on at the moment. And then finally, Jonathan, I know for, for Ibadrola, this is a bit of a different conversation because it's not that you're making a commitment so much as you're, you're radically changing what your business has been and, and, and building a different type of business for the future. So tell us more about that. Yeah, I, that's right. I mean, to be honest, we've actually been living and breathing with a climate commitment for the past 20 years because, you know, that's how long in Ibadrola we've been working on the energy transition. Um, so about 20 years ago, we started the process of changing our business, which was a small Spanish utility, uh, you know, mostly making its revenues in thermal power in Spain into what today is a, a global renewable energy powerhouse. Uh, you know, in that time, we have completely changed the business to be, uh, you know, one which is taking about 80% of its cash flows from uh, renewable energy and from transmitting and distributing that renewable energy to market. Uh, and, you know, over that period, we've, we've actually multiplied the size of our business by about six. So, you know, market cap, our profitability, our earnings per share, all of those metrics have gone up by a factor of about six, while taking about 75% out of our carbon emissions. So we've shown, you know, that when you make these climate commitments and you really go for it, not only is it, you know, good for the, the environment, but also makes pretty, you know, good business sense as well. Um, so, you know, so that's where we are today. We've got 30,000 megawatts of renewable energy generating around the world. Um, and, you know, that, you know, puts us at the kind of the forefront as a pioneer in this clean energy revolution. 
Uh, and then more particularly, what we've just recently committed to is in our own activities to be climate uh, so to be carbon neutral by 2030 in Europe. Uh, so that, that's another commitment going even further than just cleaning up our generation portfolio. We're cleaning up all of our other day-to-day -day operations as well. So as we unpack these commitments, the first thing I want to start with is financing. We have, have just wrapped up some research with Bloomberg Green and with our, our partners around corporate climate commitments. What are the, the barriers and catalysts? And, and we'll be launching this next month, so a lot more that we're excited to share with you. But just a preview that financing was really one of the things that topped the list. Questions around either getting the investment up front to invest in either the new technologies, the changes that are needed to be made here, or also proving the investment and the returns that you're going to get. So, Richard, tell us about how at JLL you've gone through that process of, of getting, um, squaring the financing around this, the buy-in that you need, and, and the return you're going to see. Uh, it's a really, really important point, and it's, it's totally different for every company. Uh, when I was putting together the plans for our uh, for the, the financial assessment of our Scope 1 and Scope 2 emission reductions, uh, which for us is essentially our building, and uh, we have a quite a very big white van engineering fleet um, in the US and in Europe as well, specifically. And the, the plans we put in place to, and if you look at the pathways that we have in order to reduce Scope, scope 1 and Scope 2, a move from EV, uh, a move into EV for our vehicles, a move into renewables, and move into operational efficiencies in each of those pathways, and then the final piece to uh, REC, uh, so REX, where necessary, or their equivalent around the world. And at the end of the day, when we put those pathways together, um, we, the papers I took to the board, we're looking at for every dollar we spent, we were getting a one and a half dollar uh, return over the period to 2034. We were getting, we're going into positive returns within five years, and we were getting a, we calculated we were going to receive a 16% IRR uh, on the back of the investment we're making. So for us, it was a very positive piece to be doing. And I have to say, everybody's different. And I think because of the size of our fleet, um, we were, we're, we're particularly advantaged from having that vehicle fleet. And therefore, once we've moved into EV, the big difference between the cost of fossil fuel and, uh, and EV uh, and, and electric going into it, it's about, it's, you're running about 10%. Even we, our calculations are on a 20% cost. And we were, it, it was a relatively easy sell to our board which then meant we were able to capitalize on that and invest in the service, uh, the services we were then able to offer the clients to do exactly the same. So it's the opposite of the, of the challenge that we that people often talk about. You know, it, it actually made the case for you to look at the financing around this, right? And I'm curious, Jonathan, if that's the same for you as you've seen this transition with Ibadrola's business. Um, talk to us about the about the investing and financing around it. Yeah, again, I think our position is a bit different from some of the others uh, on the panel because really this has become our core business. So everything we now do as a company uh, revolves around either producing clean electricity, transmitting and distributing to that to market, or selling it to customers through digital solutions. And so financing those activities is the core of what we are there to do. That's why people invest in us in the first place. Um, and, and we've invested tens of billions of euros over you know, the past two decades in uh, renewable energy infrastructure doing that. It, only last month we announced we would be investing between now and 2025 75 billion euros in clean energy infrastructure. So we are really ramping up, uh, as many are, as we move in this quest towards net zero. Uh, and what's really interesting to see is just how hungry the finance markets are to get involved. So, you know, in, in April of this year, right in the, the middle of the pandemic, uh, we placed 750 million euros worth of uh, green bonds uh, in Europe and 750 million dollars worth of green bonds in the US. And in each case, we were five, six times oversubscribed. So there is a huge hunger, actually, for people to come and finance 
clean energy infrastructure, which is a great position to be in, given the scale of the challenge ahead of us in decarbonising the power sector. Alan, one of the things that I was struck with when you were describing HP's forest positive commitments and you know the circular economy models that you're working on are how many nonprofits you listed, how many partners you listed. Um, so tell us about how you're collaborating with external stakeholders and the role they've played here. Well, uh, you know, our vision is that printing with HP is going to protect forests regardless of what brand of paper our customers use. And so what that means is we have to work not only to change our products in our own company to be the most sustainable, but also the industry. Um, so for us to do that, what we decided to do was create the HP Sustainable Forest Collaborative. It was clear that, you know, we can't do what we need to do alone. The only way we're going to be able to do it is working with others. So. Last year, we announced a partnership with World Wildlife Fund with the support of the Ford Stewardship Council and International Paper that was really all about focusing on protecting and conserving 200,000 acres of forests, uh, equivalent to the size of New York City. We picked two projects, one in Brazil and one in China. Um, and then earlier this year, we've continued to expand that. So now Arbor Day Foundation, Chenming Paper, Domtar, New Leaf, some of the biggest players in the paper industry have now joined our HP Sustainable Forest Collaborative uh, to accelerate these efforts and really focus on the forest restoration that, that we need. So, you know, collaborating across industry, I think, demonstrates um, how we all need to be working, right? Uh, we know, again, these problems and what we're facing with climate change um, is, is so complicated. And again, the only way we're going to be able to do it is if we break down those barriers and those silos and figure out ways to go to go beyond, beyond our own things that we control and how we can influence and leverage working together. Edgar, what, what Ellen said about we, we can't do what we need to do alone, I think it'd be a great tagline for the Climate Pledge. So tell us about why you all structured it in that, in that way, um, that that's yeah. really it's not something Amazon's doing alone, it's something that you're trying to do with, with partners across all industries. Uh, absolutely, and you know, Ellen put it very much right, and everyone in the panel has said it. Uh, this is, uh, this, we all want to wanna see this, uh, you know, achieve these goals, and we cannot do it alone. The Climate Pledge, you know, uh, as of yesterday, I think we made some announcements and now we include 31 signatories of all kinds of, of organizations that we have Unilever, Verizon, Siemens, Microsoft, uh, Best Buy, Uber, Infosys, Henkel, and, and others, many other great companies that are stepping up to the challenge because these not only uh, help us uh, achieve the goals for the planet, but also help uh, all stakeholders in the supply chain to know that this is coming and be able to they also make the investments and make the same commitments and have this ripple effect. So collaboration, again, is paramount. And I think the Climate Pledge, uh, we're very, very excited and proud of all the companies that have stepped up and signed to the challenge. Uh, the other part of the equation is that uh, we have uh, some ideas that we know uh, we want to move forward fast. Uh, we know about uh, renewable energy. You know, yesterday there was some announcements of the investments we made on that area uh, that made us the, the largest ever purchaser of renewable energy by uh, investing a total of almost 6.5 gigawatts. But even, even the things we know, there's so many things we don't know. So part of our strategy also to uh, foster that collaboration is to invest in, in new ventures. You know, we, we have the Climate Pledge Fund. Uh, there's a two billion venture investment program just to back companies that you know not only help Amazon achieve the, carbon, uh, the decarbonization goals, but also other companies. You know the first uh, the first recipients of the fund you know included bedroom materials that are looking at end of life of batteries for EVs and and any other electronics. We have carbon cure that is just uh, you know concrete that instead of creating emissions captures and sequesters emissions. We have turn type technologies, is motors that are just more energy efficiency. And again, the idea of all these investments is not only to invest on things that are directly in, help Amazon, but also help many other companies uh, in the journey towards net zero carbon by 2040. It's a lot of collaboration. And, and Richard, you had also mentioned another, another group to collaborate with here, which was your clients. Um, can you tell us more about how you're thinking about collaboration with JLL's clients as part of your climate commitments? Yeah, the you know, our, our clients make up ninety five percent of our uh, of, of our footprint um, the, where we're, where we're managing property on their behalf. So it actually gives us a great way of linking in with our clients, and actually uh, it, it, it creates a means of dialogue uh, 
and work, working with our clients is just great for us. And actually, uh, it, it, it's something that we just need to be doing more of in order to get down. If we're going to hit, um, if we're going to be able to sign up to the likes of an Amazon pledge by 2040, we, we need those clients with us in order to be able to do that. You know, this is not an offset position. We need to change behaviors. And uh, the, the best way of changing behaviors is actually to prove uh, to, to prove the benefits of doing so. And if we're reducing, if we're reducing the actual energy take, then it's actually saving money. That's as simple as saving carbon, of course it is. But if you're reducing your energy by half, by the technologies Amazon are looking at, or we're investing in an air conditioning um, uh, motor that we're putting on buildings now, reducing the energy requirement by 50% um, through, through one of our venture funds. That means that it's not only less carbon, but it's also saving saving on uh, uh, saving money as well. And it, it's a, that is a win-win. We we need to look for this uh, going forward. And it's a great way of, for us as a service company to have those discussions with our clients. And Jonathan, for you all, I think a, a paramount piece here is scaling the technologies that you're working on, right? It's not just developing these solutions, but how do you put them at a scale that, that they can make a, a major change? So how are you approaching that? Yeah, so, I mean, I think probably, you know, one thing that we've been arguing for, for, you know, more than 10 years is this concept of electrification and decarbonization. So this realization that, the only way you're going to meet, you know, your climate commitments and somehow meet energy demand is by electrifying the economy and decarbonising um, the, the electricity sector. And so what we've been working on for 20 years is how you decarbonise the electricity sector. And, you know, that's all about driving up scale. So we were one of the early players in the onshore wind space. That's now a huge part of the electricity market. We were one of the early players in the offshore wind space, and that's now become, I think, the backbone of the energy system in Europe going forward. Um, you know, so we've been there all the way through, trying to drive up the industrialization and make these what were at the time quite niche technology ideas into something mainstream. And the reason we had to do that is because, quite simply, if your electrification and decarbonisation plan only works if you can get the price of electricity down um, to a point which makes sense. And thankfully, that's what we've managed to do. You know, because of that scaling up, because of that technology advancement, uh, renewable energy is now the cheapest way to produce electricity. And, and you know, I think, to be totally honest with you, um, electrification and decarbonisation is the received strategy now. And, and I, I don't think that if we hadn't done what we had done in the industry to drive the price down, the politicians wouldn't be doing what they're doing right now and setting these net zero targets. So I think it's been a really important contributor to the whole climate movement is this scaling up and innovating on renewable energy technology and showing an affordable pathway to decarbonisation. On that note, Edgar, you just mentioned how Amazon has just announced that you became, became the world's largest corporate purchaser of, of renewable energy. So tell us more about how you're thinking about Amazon's role in, in that scaling up around renewables. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that that's a, a very good point. Uh, when we were doing our uh, mapping of our journey, you know, we have our science teams, you know, mapping the carbon footprint, understanding exactly where the hotspot is, and energy scope two emissions are always one of those super important areas. So we took the decisive action on on how to truly move fast in in, in investing in renewable energies. Uh, again, uh, we need to look at our whole portfolio as an organization. We have AWS data centers, we have fulfillment centers, we have whole food markets. Uh, stores. So we, with all those things, we definitely need to uh, look at utility scale uh, investments. Again, the announcement that we made yesterday, there were 26 additional utility scale wind and solar energy projects that we have invested around the world uh, uh, that is going to power uh, all of our data centers, uh, corporate offices, etc. And again, this is where we look at around the company and we said we should join forces and truly move, move fast and uh, unblock any potential business that may have been wanted to do this uh, as a whole. And I think that's how we've been able to make in, in such a short time so much progress, leveraging our scale. And again, looking back, backwards, working backwards from our emissions, knowing this is an area we need to move much, much 
aggressively. Um, I think that that's probably one of the lessons here is that in some areas, we can pull as an organization and kind of centralize and really divert our resources. In other areas, we definitely need to rely more on individuals and their own business leaders. And for that, what we've done is the opposite is kind of give them the tools for them to be able to make the decisions. Uh, I know we all talk about carbon footprint, but once you get to the details, it's hard for business uh, uh, leaders to grasp all the trade-offs. So we're trying to give that information and embed it in their everyday to day decision. And that's how we landed into some of our Rivian electric vehicle investments, et cetera, for every business to find their own path, as well as uh, pulling to the resources together within the company. So let's say you've, you've made a great commitment. You've done all the background work that we've talked about here. You've gotten people on board and something unforeseen. Let's just say a global pandemic comes along and throws you off course. So Ellen, how do you, how do you prevent something like that from, from throwing off all the work that you've been doing or all these, these commitments that you've been making? Sure, well, you know, no excuses, right? I mean, that's the attitude we have with regard to our commitments. There are no excuses. And uh, especially when you're thinking about serious issues like climate change, we are running out of time. You know, there's there's no time uh, to, to, to back away or to uh, weaken, you know, the action that we're taking. So a really interesting example of some of the challenges we faced regarding the pandemic uh, revolved around our transition to a circular economy and using more recycled plastic in our products. We have a project in Haiti where we source ocean-bound plastic and upcycle it into things like HP print cartridges, um, into our PC products. Uh, and to date, we've used over 60 million bottles upcycled from ocean-bound plastic in our products. As part of our efforts to scale, we now have over 50 products that use this material. We had committed a year ago um, to building an ocean-bound plastic washing line in Haiti. So something we've never done before uh, as part of doing things, you know, in a more disruptive way and reinventing how our supply chain works. Uh, we were purchasing this recycling infrastructure equipment to put in Haiti. Well, you know, the 10 containers of this washing line that we had custom built in Germany was shipped, arrived down in Haiti in February, and we had a five-week installation period where the installers from Germany and Montreal were going to fly down to build it. Uh, well, you know, early March, all flights stopped, right? So our team, our installers couldn't get down there. Um, so this was, you know, a, a choice. We could back off and say, well, we've got excuses. We can't get an installation team down there. We can't build it. Let's just hold our plans. Let's divert. Let's change, you know, what we're doing. Um, and instead, uh, what the team did was rethink how could we do this? And what they ended up doing was pretty amazing. They built it virtually. So the install team stayed in Germany and in Montreal. We, like all of us are doing right now, set up Zoom meetings every day where those installation experts zoomed into Haiti. We hired a local team of technicians, certainly technicians that had never built anything quite like uh, something of the complexity of this washing line. But reinventing how we work in this new virtual environment using technology, um, we were able to build that washing line. And we just held the ribbon cutting ceremony for it. It's up, it's running, uh, and it's pretty amazing. But I think it comes back to determination, no excuses. The time is right now. Uh, we cannot wait and just working across these obstacles. Uh, and again, I'm gonna go back to collaboration. It took you know, this collaborative team of the supplier in Germany, our recycling experts of our first tier supplier in Montreal, our own engineers working together with the local technicians on the ground to figure out how to do that safely. So things are possible that you don't think are possible, even in this uh, very unusual time. I love this no excuses approach, Ellen. And Richard, how about you? Share with us that, you know, you guys have made some major commitments this year despite COVID. So how have you been approaching getting over these barriers? Well, I think COVID has just taught us all that what we were doing didn't work. Um, and we all talk about building back better. But in, in, in my own business, uh, in the real estate business, there is so much. That two thirds of our existing building stock will still be here in 2050. So it's not just a matter of building differently. Real estate is responsible for 40% of the world's carbon emissions. Um, and that is not just operating buildings, and that's one piece. So that's the existing buildings. How can we retrofit those? Um, and that's possible. The Empire State Building, we, we're working with the owners there. We've taken out 40% of the energy demand uh, 
uh, in the Empire State Building, all of the windows have been um, refitted using the existing glass, but we've done 90%, 96% of that is being renewed, not being replaced. With all the lifts, we've actually put brakes, the brakes in the lift, there were always brakes, uh, but the brakes that have been put into the lift now are actually creating energy as they break. So that is reducing the total energy requirement. Retrofit is going to be massive going forward, but equally on new build, circularity, and I 100% agree with that, circularity, we're all talking about net zero, which I think leading up to COP26 is going to be massive, but circularity, the use of new materials, new building materials, new fit out, how, how we fit out our offices will be changing so that everything will become modular and reusable going forward. Edgar, I'd love to direct you a question that we've gotten from the audience asking about the importance of, of environmental education. And I think let's expand this as well to also ask about um, the importance of younger generations who are stepping up, who are encouraging companies or their leaders or themselves to make major climate commitments. Tell us about what, what you think that's gonna, gonna create for climate in the future. Uh, yeah, so I mean, so definitely there's a need to continue to invest on making this science available. But I think even the pandemic itself kind of shows the importance of the of this. I think Ellen said it. I mean, uh, we we had to uh, make sure that our sources were safe, invest clearly in in with our partners to continue to deliver our customers what they needed in the pandemic. But you know, climate change doesn't stop because there's a pandemic. You know, climate change continues. This is something we need to continue to track down. So I think there's two fronts on, on this education. Why is leading by example? Despite all the growing challenges that we had as a company to be able to meet the growing demand, we did not slow down our, our journey on climate. So we really mean it. It's part of the business. It's not a one or an optional thing we do when we have time. It is our, our journey that we are going to continue to do. So on some way, uh, just moving along despite all the obstacles, this is as important as anything else we do as a company. So I think that that's a, an important message that we need to give to a lot of people that are out there, generations. And of course, as we continue to invest in our climate funds, uh, we're going to look for opportunities to disseminate uh, and make this more uh, accessible. We have partnership with small enterprises that uh, help us to propagate our message. But absolutely, education on one end, leading by example, I think is also the other uh, side of the equation that we should be uh, driving forward. And Jonathan, from your perspective, what do, what do you see as Ibadrola's role in helping us to build back from this this challenging year? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think the, the 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 pandemic was a really interesting exercise. I think in showing people just how much an external or natural event can totally disrupt our way of lives, completely break down our social and economic systems, um, but also how adaptive we can be and how we can we can adjust our way of life quite quickly. And I think most people recognise that if that pandemic was a tidal wave, climate change is a tsunami, and it will have way longer lasting, you know, much deeper effects than, than that pandemic could have. So the imperative to act, I think, has really been, you know, thrown in front of us. Um, I, from our part, I mean, I think what's interesting to note is that just how the electricity sector almost managed to carry on without missing a step. You know, we're an essential part of the economy, providing an essential service to hospitals and all the other frontline services. We had to find a way to safely carry on. And if you look not just in our own company, but across the piece, you know, the, the big operating assets kept operating uh, as, they, uh, as they should have. So we really stepped up, I think, and delivered what was needed. And then looking forward, you've got this amazing marrying up of your climate requirements and the need to invest your way out of a global recession, and you bring those two together and you invest the tens of billions of euros that we're talking about in clean energy infrastructure, and you're managing to tick both boxes. So I think that, you know, for the first time in our history, our economic interests and our climate interests are perfectly aligned in the short term. That hasn't been the case until now, and I think we really need to take advantage of that, and we will not look back from this point. We're just a couple of weeks away from 2021 now. So I want to end by asking each of you, what do you think is the next step for your for your climate goal and what's going to be happening in 2021? Ellen, let's start with you. 
Sure. Well, you know, again, we are so committed to um, to action in this space. While setting, you know, big goals is clearly important. And, you know, this decade, 2021 to 2030, is being termed the decisive decade, the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. We understand the urgency, but for us, it really is about action. So living into those commitments, turning out results, inspiring others um, across our industry, across other industries, and working together to collaborate, break down those barriers and make big things happen, make big change happen. So um, we've got a, a whole host of commitments and actions that we're delivering every day, things around the forest programs that I mentioned, our ocean-bound plastic programs, um, delivering towards a circular economy, uh, lots of work to do, and we're gonna continue to take action. Great. Jonathan, what about you? Next steps for 2021. Well, I mentioned earlier on that we'd announced the 75 billion euro investment program over the next five years. So over the past 20 years, we've you know grown ourselves to be the largest renewable energy player in the world. In the next five years, we're going to double our size. So, you know, starting now, we are working onshore wind, solar energy, offshore wind, hydrogen schemes, battery schemes. We're investing in smart networks and um, digital solutions for customers to make all of that come true. So, you know, we, we, the work will not stop for us in delivering that clean energy future. Richard, what about you at JLL? I think for us, uh, net zero is the immediate issue as we build up to COP26 and the race to net zero. And it's not just a matter of having a target. We can all set targets. It's a matter of actually knowing what your data is. And this applies to all of us because we all have to be transparent and we have to be collaborative. None of us are going to do this on our own, uh, find the right answers. But I think it is to actually have not just the target, but also to have the pathways to achieve it and the roadmap and the milestones to measure ourselves against as we do. So I think we need the whole process and all of us individually doing our own thing, but working collaboratively and in cooperation. Because as I say, I don't think we're all going to, we're not going to achieve a 2050 or 2040 net zero goal if we all try to do our own thing. And Edgar, the final word goes to you. Tell us what we can expect from Amazon's climate commitments in 2021. Well, uh, uh, first, uh, more companies joining the climate pledge. I think that we need to get more people excited, more people making these commitments, making these bold investments. So I invite all of them, and I think we're going to see much more of uh, companies joining and, and us helping uh, that journey. And we have made some big steps on energy, on electrification of fleets. Uh, but this is just the journey, the, the first step in the journey. We we need to execute on them, track them, make sure we deliver them. So we're going to continue focusing on a, a few of those areas and looking what our Climate Place Fund uh, discovers as we go in our journey. Edgar, Ellen, Richard, and Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again to all of our speakers for a wonderful program. And thank you for joining us for the Bloomberg Green Solution Summit. We hope you enjoyed our conversations and we appreciate you being such an engaged audience. Thank you to our summit founding partners, Amazon, HP, JLL, and to our presenting sponsor, Ibadrola, for making this virtual summit possible. I also wanna thank all of our Bloomberg Green founding partners, Amazon, HP, JLL, PGM, and Tiffany and Company for their continued partnership on this year on this important and timely initiative. And most of all, thank you again for being part of this audience. If you'd like to rewatch any part of this event, you can come back to this website where the recordings will be uploaded. You can also access videos of all interviews on Bloomberg Live's page on YouTube. For more climate news, visit bloomberg.com green. There you can find more information, including on our, our winter 2020 edition of the Bloomberg Green Magazine, which we, we just released yesterday. You can see the feature on our cover on carbon offsets, 41 things Biden should do first on climate change, the origins of China's climate plan, and so much more. So I really encourage you, go to our, our website and check it out. You can read the e-magazine there. This is our last Bloomberg Green event of 2020, but we have so many great things coming up for you in 2021. We'll be hosting the second annual Bloomberg Green Virtual Festival on Earth Day in April 2021. We're also planning for an incredible in-person event in the UK in September. For more details, look at our website over the next couple of months. We can't wait to see you there. Thank you again for watching.
I know firsthand that it is possible to save people's lives, grow local economies, and fight the climate crisis all at once. I'm calling on all leaders and all countries to show their leadership and really step up and double their support. Global warming is not simply an academic concept. The key to solving any of the problems we face, but especially climate change, is working together to find and implement solutions that can make a difference. Not only is climate change a problem, but we actually have a lot of particularly poor communities in very close proximity um, to polluting refineries that, that, that have contributed to um, the degradation of human health, particularly along racial and class lines. Climate change is much harder, and the damage that will be done every year uh, will be greater than what we've seen during this pandemic. When the scientists are setting their hair on fire, so to speak, and trying to warn us in ways that'll get our attention, it's best not to ignore them. These 10 years that we have from 2020 to 2030 are, without exaggeration, the decisive decade in the history of humankind. Our movement needs to do a better job of expanding itself. We have to start building the future we want to have.